So this is the lumber pile I currently have in my shop. It's almost 100 board feet of cherry, maple, and oak. And um, my next four or so projects, I'm going to be using mostly hardwood lumber. So while I was starting to cut the stuff up to start milling it, I decided to make a video showing how I mill lumber um, just so that for the next couple of videos, I don't have to constantly repeat and explain the process because it's kind of like sanding. It's a little dull to watch repetitively. Um, it takes a lot of time to send lumber through the planer, so it's just not super exciting to film and I think watch in other videos. So then as I was cutting it up, I kind of decided to expand upon that original concept and make it geared more towards beginners who don't know how to get um, hardwood lumber and mill it and what to be looking for. So if a fact-based videos are not your thing, um, I would recommend not watching this. And also, just as a precursor to the whole thing, I know there's a lot of thoughts and theories on lumber, how to buy it, what humidity it should be, um, so forth and whatnot. This is how I do it. It works for me. Um, I'm fine with suggestions, but at the same time, um, sometimes suggestions are based on personal preference. So this video is geared towards how I do it. So like I said, this is just some footage of me cutting up some oak I'm using for a project. I already had this milled and ready to go by the time I started this video, so I just decided to use this as the intro. I got all this lumber from a local guy who lives like five minutes away. He will get trees that people have cut down, mill it on his sawmill, and then sell the planks which means the price is excellent and he's also a really cool guy easy to work with easy to talk to so this lumber I would got about a week ago I didn't bring a camera with me when I went to the lumber yard but this is Greg with his portable sawmill and when I uh, go to this place he has a bunch of huge outbuildings and just stacks of lumber everywhere he keeps most of his lumber outside so when I buy from him I have to bring it back to my shop even though my shop is an outdoor shop basically with the door open and no temperature control and stack and stick it and let it sit there for at least a week to acclimate some people even let it set longer so this is that stack back in my shop and I have it stacked based on when I'm using um, the pieces so the cherries on bottom the maple and the oak are on top so the oak was was kept outside as well as the maple most of the cherry he had in his in his shop so it has some dirt on it and whatnot and and basically what I do to start before I start planting anything is I go through the stack and I'm using a putty knife to remove some of the dirt dirt will dull your blades very quickly and then I just kind of check the ends and because there's going to be checks on the ends of this lumber I cut those off there's really no sense in planing them and I make two stacks I make a stack that's ready to go right through the planer and then I make another stack of boards that have serious bows cups or twists in which case I'll have to use a planing jig so these are the common warping issues with lumber I have found that bows and twists um, I usually have to use my planing jig but if boards are cupped I could get away without using it um, the, where you get your lumber from is going to be kind of um, indicative of what kind of bends are in your wood. Obviously the wood is going to do what it wants as it dries, but poorly stacked lumber as the lumber is drying will just make um, these twists much more apparent and, and harder to take out. So this is that stack I have. The two top boards I ended up planing with the planing jig. I use a planing jig because I don't have a jointer and I have a video on my channel showing you how I made that. All the bottom ones you could see are setting fairly flat. So I was able to send those right through my planer. And the end judgment for that is, as you could see, the planer is taking off bits and pieces of the board. Um, the reason that you have to use the jointer is because a lot of the times with the planer, the two wheels inside of it that, that, that um, flank the blade will commonly push down on the board as it's sent through. So it might plane the whole surface, but then the board um, comes out the end and, 
and and flexes back into shape because it's no longer being pushed down by those rollers so if you have a board that you can push on your table and it rocks you're going to have to use some sort of planing jig but if your board sit flat on your table or fairly flat on your table and you could see now as i'm sending them through the first pass through the planer they're only taking off the high spots you can get away with planing right away so i was pretty lucky with most of these boards i was able to do that so just send them through the planer so I'm able to just send them through that was the first pass and you'll see the more you send them through they'll get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner because that planer is knocking off all of my high spots now when I go to Greg's I have a board foot um, already calculated for my projects so a board foot is any configuration of a foot by a foot by an inch but that measurement changes based on width and thickness and length of your boards. So you could see from this graphic, all of these pieces of lumber is one board foot. So especially as the thickness of your boards change, it can be a little difficult to calculate what you need. So I use this website and I'll put links in the description to all of this stuff, which helps you calculate all your board foots. Um, and you could do it, you could piece it out because if you need 50 board feet, but you go to the lumber store and buy 50 board feet and the wrong thickness and the wrong width, then that won't really help you out. So then once you have that board foot calcul calculated, you also should add 15 to 20 percent to that number because you're going to be losing a lot of material. Sometimes an example with Greg's lumber, the lumber that was stored outside is, is pretty pretty dirty on the top so you, there might be defects in the wood that you can't see and you'll lose those pieces you'll have to cut around them so I always add at least 20, 15 to 20 percent to make sure I have enough. So with my board foot calculated I go to Greg's and I could pick out my lumber. Now I trust Greg um, his he tells me how long his lumber has been sitting a lot of its air dried but he does kiln dry and some of it kiln drying just just expedites the process of drying lumber but you should know who you're buying from what their moisture content of their lumber is I know this is a hotly cont uh, contested issue on YouTube but the moisture content number I usually work from is it should be no more to, than six to eight percent moisture and then like I said I bring it back to my shop and let it acclimate and, and reach somewhat of an equilibrium again before I start using it if you use wood that has too much moisture in it it's going to shrink after you finish building your project and it will crack and check now these are usually not immediate um, effects of un, uh, unproperly dried lumber sometimes furniture will last a few months and be fine but usually at the change of the seasons is when you'll start seeing problems you also have to do it relative to where you live in the part of the country I live in on the East Coast I live right outside of Philly there's huge moisture changes and the changes of the seasons other people that live in climates that are fairly relative throughout the year aren't going to have as much of an issue with wood changing um, but if you're someone like me who makes furniture that sometimes ships to other places I just use a good practice of building all of my pieces similarly um, for changes in moisture so I don't have to worry about it so here is a graphic uh, the graphic a video of that that finished plain lumber there's only one spot where daylight's really still peeking through but in general most of these boards ended up being pretty flat so this is that board with that substantial bow in it and for that one I actually ended up cutting it in half to make my life easier because I knew I would need a piece, a piece at least that short. So you could see how um, this is the planer jig. It's just a flat piece of MDF that the, the lumber could sit on so it has a flat base to be sent through the planer. I shim it with some shims so that it do, until it doesn't rock anymore and then I send it through you could see that it's doing the exact same thing it was doing with the other lumber this is catching on my air hose where it's just it's taking off the high spots and because it's shimmed the rollers can't push it down so we're at the points where it rocks and then it can't spring back up afterwards this process works really good for bowed and cup lumber if you don't have a jointer however as you can see you can only plane one board at a time so if you have 15 boards to do with a jig like this it will be very time consuming 
So back to moisture content, the best way to judge the moisture content of the material is to have a moisture meter. So these are what Wagner moisture meters look like. I do not own one of these because the good ones are upwards of a couple hundred dollars. Um, the really good one is like 500 bucks. So like I said, I trust Greg. He's not selling me wet lumber. And um, the other place I buy lumber from, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is, is a, a lumber mill that's actually pretty well known. And once again, they're not going to be selling the wrong moisture contented lumber. So if you don't want to put forth the money to, to buy a moisture meter, my recommendation is to get your lumber from someone you trust. It can be difficult because I've seen some really good deals on lumber on the internet and on Craigslist, but if they're not willing to tell you what the moisture content of that lumber is and you buy it, the average drying time for lumber is going to be a year for an inch worth of thickness. So it could be a while before you can use that lumber. So you can see from the video now, I have that front face planed and now it sits on the table without rocking. So the jointing jig is very similar to a jointer in that you only have to finish one face like that on the jointer, then I could just send it to the planer without the jig. So I kind of kept a mental track of how many passes I sent these boards through. You really want to remove the same amount of material from both sides of your boards just so that it stays somewhat in equilibrium with itself. If you take three quarters of an inch off one side and none off the other, um, you, you could potentially re-warp and bow your boards. So one last point about moisture content is um, it's very common now to work with construction grade 2x4s. I just made a project out of construction grade 2x4s, but it's worth noting that is because even if you go to the lumber store and buy kiln dry construction grade lumber, the moisture, con uh, the moisture content in the wood is still going to be higher. And that's because for construction, the moisture content only has to be about 9 to 14%. So depending on what you're building, it's not something you have to worry about largely, but um, construction grade lumber is going to shrink a little bit more even after you purchase it. Um, it's worth knowing that the, the moisture content is going to be higher, and the reasoning is because in that industry, that's what they're looking for. So after humidity content, the grain pattern of your lumber is also very important. It can be important essentially because the customer might want a certain type of grain pattern to show on the face of their lumber, but also because from these graphics you can see different types of, of grain patterns react um, differently over time. So flat sawn lumber, which is all the lumber I got, is one of the more unstable lumbers, whereas quarter sawn or riff sawn lumber will will not warp as much over time, but that means they're also more expensive because you get less out of the log with those cutting methods. Like I said, I only needed flat sawn for this, and to be perfectly honest, I don't pay as much attention to grain pattern as I probably should. Um, I'm getting a little bit better at checking the ends of boards to be able to tell how the log was cut and how it will react over time, but those graphics will basically show you by looking at the end pattern of that grain, where it came from in the log, and, and what kind of warpage it's prone to. Another note on top of all of this for buying lumber is going to be the quarter system. Most lumber yards are going to use the quarter system um, in order to define the thickness of their lumber. So four quarter rec uh, references quarters of an inch, so four quarter would be one inch which means that eight quarter is going to be two inches, 12 quarter is going to be three inches. So the only problem with Greg is he usually has lumber that is going to end up being three quarters of an inch, which means he sells mainly four quarter lumber. So that is where other lumber yards come into play if I need something a little bit thicker. Sometimes they'll have thicker walnut. So this screenshot's kind of hard to see on here, so if you want to know more, you could go to the website, but this uh, website describes the quarter system and also the, the labeling system of lumber. So lumber figure usually affects the price of lumber. Um, curly maple is more expensive than plain saw maple, and also how much work the lumber yard has put into those boards. So you'll see 
S1S, which will mean surfaced one side. You'll see S4S, which means surface four sides. And the more surfacing the lumber mill uses, the more expensive it's going to be. So before you go to the mill, it might be worth it to look at those abbreviations and just kind of familiar self, familiar, familiarize yourself with them just so that you know what they're talking about. So now that I have all of my boards planed, they're all the same thickness and everything's flat, I send everything through my jointing jig. This jig works really well in lieu of a jointer to surface one edge. So that blade is, is recessed in this piece of MDF so that it works just like a jointer and removes about an eighth of an inch of lumber at a time. Longer pieces can be a little bit difficult to do with this jig because if there is a bow in the center of the board, the board will ride um, on that bow and you could actually accentuate the bow instead of getting rid of it. So you just have to be careful of, of how you're holding the piece on, on longer boards. But these shorter boards, it's really pretty simple. I send it through about four times and, and uh, get it pretty flat. I use the, the jig itself as a reference for flatness. Um, you can see right here, sometimes if you try and take off too much at once, it will get jammed and um, you'll have to redo it. But I use that, that, that flat piece of, it's actually a composite, it's not MDF, to, to use as a reference to see how flat my boards are coming off that outfeed table. And, and I do all of these at once, I get one flat edge, and now that the pieces are planed, um, then I could use it for a project. Now some of these boards, like this one that still has some of the lumber in the center, is because I ended up for this piece planing those down to three quarters of an inch, and, and I will, it will end up removing all of that leftover residue. So on top of the quarter system, a proper lumber mill, if you're buying four quarter lumber, it's actually thicker than an inch. The, the reference of four quarter lumber means that that is the, the nominal value it's going to be once you're done planing it. So if you want inch lumber, you can't buy rough inch lumber because I ended up taking off probably about an eighth of an inch on all of these pieces at the end of the day. So the pro the lumber mill, when you go there, if you measure it, it's usually um, sometimes the 16th and 8th even more thicker than your final piece. They do that so that you have enough lumber to remove to get that end product. So just be careful because I've been to places and bought lumber that is, let's say, four quarter and it's it's almost exactly an inch so by the time you're done planing it it's less than an inch um, places that will surface your lumber for you it will be a little bit thinner than what i'm saying now because they've already surfaced one side of it so it doesn't have to be as thick so you can see this is how i tell when it's ready i kind of gauge it off that flat fence and when there's no gap that one edge is perfectly jointed so when i need thicker lumber this is where i go this is kind of some photos off of um hearn hardwoods website this place is about a half an hour from my house when you walk in, they just have stacks and stacks of lumber. The staff is very friendly, and they'll pretty much do whatever you want to your pieces if you don't have the machine. So that could be a bonus for people that don't have machines. You can It will cost you, but you can go there, pick out your lumber, and they'll surface all the sides for you so you're ready to go. The screenshots are a little small on here, but this is kind of a screenshot of their price list online. You could see how they're using all of the quarter system and codes to to delineate what you're what you're shopping for i will say however the quarter system must be confusing to some people because i hadn't checked their price list in quite a while and i've noticed they've moved to to um, classifying their lumber in the in the inch system now so you can see all that lumber that i started with that was kind of dirty and filthy as now nice clean maple and once i'm done with it i restack it with the the, the sticks in it um, wood is going to be constantly moving on you. If you stack this flat, it's going to warp and bow again. The point of the stickers is so that you have air movement around the whole piece as much as possible. So once I'm done, like I said, I restack this until I'm starting to turn it into furniture. You could see here, now that I have those pieces, I'm cutting them down to size and I'm going to plane these boards to three quarters um, for my 
for my piece. So I have a stack of lumber now that I'm working off of that's all the same size and I could do cut it and rip it down because it has one flat edge or make it thinner if I have to. So I know that that is a lot of information, but I tried to make this video geared towards beginners and I tried to uh, fill it with information I found hard to find when I first started woodworking in one uh, localized source. You can't really go online and find all this information in one spot. It's kind of a matter of reading around a lot of places, but all of these things, it might seem like a lot at first, is very important to know when milling lumber because the final project is pretty contingent on having stable, flat materials to work with in the beginning. So like I said, I put a lot of screenshots in here and they probably will show up a little bit small on phones especially. So I'm gonna put links to all of these websites in, in the description box. And lastly, if you're like me, I'm fairly shy. So when I first started buying lumber, I actually bought it online. So there's a couple of good resources online. One's Woodworker Source. Another one I recently started going to is Green Valley. I believe it's Green Valley Woods. I just bought some table legs from there. It's going to cost more because most of this stuff becomes um, pre-milled, which is nice if you don't have big machines and shipping is expensive, but it is a nice alternative to someone who's not by a mill and wants to just kind of get a couple pieces without having to go, go through the process of, of um, all of this. So I'm going to end this video showing um, ripping down those boards, which is now easy because I have milled lumber with a flat edge so I could it will ride nicely against my table saw fence. Um, I hope you got something out of this video. I tried to make it as comprehensive as possible without rambling on too long. You can really get much more in depth on all of these topics and kind of the nature of YouTube is going to be as soon as I edit this and post it, I'll think of five other things I wanted to add to the video. But I tried to cover as much topics as I could think of um, this past week while I was milling this stuff and, and um, hopefully, like I said, people will get something out of it because it can be a lot in the beginning um, knowing what to look for and where to shop for this stuff.